Howdy folks, I am not sure if my audio sounds weird, so I am testing, testing. It's weird, so I am testing. Okay, looks good. Hello, my friends. Who we? Real close to the wire on this one. But I believe I've got my audio set up. Who we? That was a close one. But uh, we're here. You made it. Excited to talk about um, a very exciting feature of computers, um, how they go so darn fast and do so much stuff. Um, basically, today we're talking about automation and programming. Uh, just super basic overview, not going to get into really techy weeds here. Um, you can go do that on your own time. Um, but I just want to talk about some of the concepts that... Uh, Probably some of this we're familiar with, we just aren't familiar with how exactly computers do it. So, um, let me get a glass of water. Dear Lord, this, this day. Although, my parents did come by and set up a projector screen on my wall, which I'm super excited about. And, uh, maybe my mom is a good student and listening this time, but, um, uh, if not, she's got homework for next week. So let's hop right into it, folks. Let me share my screen with all of you lovely humans. As you all know, every time you come here, I just want to remind you that you are your teacher. I'm just the red-haired lady on the internet that uh, has seen some things that uh, I've, I've taken a few pieces from a bunch of different places to try and present it in some sort of cohesive fashion that you might be able to see the, the forest for the trees a little bit. Uh, because it just seems like tech is, you know, this terrifying, scary thing because there's so many pieces we don't understand, but when we when we get the gist of what's working together to make things happen, I think that makes it a lot easier to learn, and it makes it helps us figure out the things we might want to learn within it, um, because I feel like once you get pulled by something and really get, oh, I want to learn that, and you learn that one thing, then you're going to learn how that thing can help you do all those other things. So we're just jumping around and learning all sorts of stuff. And on this one, we are learning about automation and programming. So, I mean, I feel like it's pretty cool to think about um, how fast and how quickly computers have become just an, an integral part of our life. It's sort of like none of us are even disconnected from our smoke, smartphone for uh, any amount of time. It sits by our bedstand, it, it wakes us up, it takes pictures, it takes videos, it helps us chat with our friends, it does more things than a phone <laughs> ever used to do. And, uh, you know, it's, it's only going to get more complex and wild and crazy, um, the level of integration. Um, I feel like I would like more of it to go where tech sort of floats into the background. So it's, it's kind of like we're less staring into these little rectangles and more it's like helping us be more human. But uh, if I want to be able to do that, I have to know how it works. Uh, so I'm excited to share with you uh, a little bit about automation and the things that computers do to go fast and do stuff as this season is all about. So we're going to break it into three parts. Uh, first about automation and scripting. And we'll go a brief overview of programming that I'm not very good at it, first of all, but I at least know the basics. It's kind of like I can, I can uh, uh, hear but not speak it uh, kind of language thing for me. And then regular expressions, which if you're not familiar with, you will be and you'll see how cool they are. And especially you'll, if you come into, if you find some data that you really could use regular expressions for, it will make your life a lot easier if you... Uh, learn a little bit of that grammar. So we'll go over that. So first of all, automation and scripting. Uh, I sort of just wanted to bundle things that weren't exactly programming. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about the difference between scripting and programming. It's not very different. But I thought it was cool to, to show some examples of some automation that we're probably already familiar with. So um, a few kinds you might be familiar with. Uh, firstly, keyboard shortcuts. You don't necessarily think of that all the time, but that is automating something where normally you'd have to take your mouse and go all the way over to that thing and click on the thing and then maybe click on some more things to make it do the thing that you want it to do. But uh, I find keyboard shortcuts 
are a great time saver. And uh, well, we'll go over a few in a little bit because I think, honestly, this could cut down the amount of time you take navigating through a computer dramatically if you know where some of these uh, shortcuts are. And obviously you can find more of your own. Uh, next is uh, Excel formulas. Uh, this is also, you know, Excel is the the uh, the legacy product that uh, began all the others. But now you have like LibreOffice, which is the free version, uh, a free open source version of Office, or uh, Google Sheets is the equivalent. Uh, their formulas aren't quite as advanced, Sheets in particular. But uh, Excel can do some very cool things. And I was introduced to this at an old job at a vacation rental place. My manager was super handy with Excel. The, the magic he made happen uh, where you could just throw in a file and then the Excel document would calculate a bunch of stuff for you and uh, make the daily housekeeping schedule, make the like, which, which reservations do you have to look at? It was really fascinating and all done with, an, with Excel. So we'll go over a brief example of that. And then style sheets. Um, that is, I wonder if I should just show the example here because I didn't give a slide for it. Style sheets are something that uh, started, I believe, in Word or maybe WordPerfect uh, back in the day. Um, but what that allows you to do is sort of match styles across the entire document. So when you change it in one place, it changes everywhere. And modern websites actually use this nowadays where it used to be you had to code each HTML page separately, and then you'd be reusing a lot of code to make sure that the color of your fonts stay the same and all that. But now it's it's all gathered into style sheets so that you could have your web page and it's all done. And then say the client's like, well, I wish that this title was bold. Then you could just, rather than going through every page in the website where the client wanted it bold, you could just change the style sheet for heading one and it would all change. Um, yeah, I think I will just give you a, a quick example of that in um, LibreOffice Writer. So if I make a chapter about bugs, and so I pressed Control-1 was the uh, was the uh, shortcut that I used to make it Heading-1. Now I'll make a Heading-3. See, so I press Control-3 to change it to Heading-3. And uh, Scary Bugs. And then I could talk about Scary Bugs. And then I could be friendly bugs. And then we could have a chapter about spiders. And then we could have one about venomous spiders. And then one about cute spiders. Now, you could imagine this is, let's say this was all separate web pages, but the cool thing about this is if I just want to change the title for all the chapter sort of headings I used here with heading three, I could just change the font. Let's say I wanted to make it italics and underline and get rid of the bold like that. And then I can click update style sheet and all the heading threes change to that style. So that's the really cool thing about websites where like if we just look at my website and you right click on any page on the internet and you go to view page source, you'll see a lot of these references uh, somewhere is going to be the style sheet in here. Uh, so yeah, here's a link to one style sheet. I'm not sure exactly how Squarespace does it, but um, here's how it breaks it up. It uses these div fields, so a divider, and then it gives it a class. So that social links inner, that is defined in the style sheet of what that social links does. So it, it gives it uh, colors for the icons. So these little icons over here in the corner, the LinkedIn, Twitter, and Spotify links. If I change the style sheet to just change the color, um, all of those would update automatically and I wouldn't have to change the code in multiple places. So style sheets are a, a wonderful tool of automation and especially for building websites uh, that if you do UI stuff, you'll definitely be dealing with that kind of thing. And lastly, we'll just skip ahead. The last thing is macros. Uh, I don't have a sample macro. The ones I looked online were kind of boring, but you can do really cool stuff with that. Um, it just automates things inside of a document. So you could have a macro, <clears throat> say a bank wanted, you know, a, a submit form button. So you could download the PDF, type in a bunch of your information, and then click a button that says submit form, and it would 
post that data to your website so you could review it and you would have the client's thing without them taking multiple clicks. There's a zillion other things you can do. Basically, macros are just like a button to do something else or automate something else. Uh, that uh, I, you know, there's some word macros that are just uh, like changing dates into a certain format. You could make a macro for that. You could do all sorts of things. But basically, they're very simple and they use um, a very simplified programming language within the Office suite, um, Visual Basic, I think. Uh, but that's just an example. Um, because I don't have a slide for Excel formulas, I will also show you a brief, really cool thing with uh, LibreOffice Calc, which is basically like Excel. Um, this is this feature called VLOOKUP that we're going to use is what you can use to do all sorts of really cool Excel automation, especially when you're messing with a lot of data. So let's say we have a, a game with uh, four, four names here, Alice, Angel, Annette, Anachronist, Doug, Dangerous, and Greg Gregarious. Let's say they're, they're fighters in a fighter game. And let's say uh, Doug's, Alice's power level is five, Annette is four, Doug is three, and Greg's five also. So if we had a field over here, choose your character, and then your power level here, we could, for example, uh, we've got this field F2, F1 where we're going to choose our character. So let's choose Alice. And then our power level, we want to use a VLOOKUP to look over here for who we chose up here and then report back the power level. So the way the VLOOKUP, I know this is pretty small, but VLOOKUP, the first thing is what am I searching for? So I want to look for what's ever put in F1 right here. Uh, so we're going to put F1, comma, and now, and see, you can see, it gives you a little helper here thing. The search criteria first, and then comma, and then the array. So what, what do we want to look through? Well, we want to look from here to here, from A1 to C4. So we can even use our mouse and it fills it in for us. But we're looking from A1 through C4. And then we want this value. We want the power level. So we put in, that's the third column in our selection. So, because here's column one, here's column two, here's column three, we want to report the value over here when we find the value somewhere in here. So, we put three, oops, three, close up, and we get an error because uh, Haley put in the uh, reference badly. A1 to C4. Yay! Okay, always the live demo goes wrong. But see, we chose Alice, and so it's finding Alice and reporting back uh, the value on that row for Alice. So we could even put Angel, and it's going to report that, or Dangerous, and it's going to report... Oh, I don't know why it's doing that. It should be reporting three. I wonder if it's because we should only use this row. Um, but if we choose Doug, yeah, so when we choose Doug, it does three. Greg, it does five. Annette, it does four. So that's just, it's a, it's a silly example, but you can you can group together a lot of these type of VLOOKUP lookups to automate looking through large sets of data and finding things really quickly with a VLOOKUP or, or counting the number of times it appears in a, in a column or I mean, there's all sorts of cool things you can do with Excel formulas. I don't want to spend a whole class on it. I just wanted to show you there's an example of some cool stuff you can do with Excel. And when you get really large data sets, um, this type of formula matching, because you can you could match for certain things or a certain pattern or count the number of times something happens. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different things you can do with Excel. And uh, I mean, <laughs> I just want to show you real quick. Uh, you can even make a 3D engine in Excel. Like, look at this silliness. Yes, a pseudo 3D engine in Excel. This person, I mean, those are little cells that are changing based off of the input. So he's, or they are pressing Q or E to turn, 
and it's turning and updating a 3D environment that is being rendered with cell backgrounds. That's wild. Uh, there's even, they have uh, Excel ray tracing. They did it with ray tracing, which gives you sort of light bouncing off other objects. So look, look at those spheres. That's, that's wild. They've got the, the little reflection on the, the floor and that's all done with Excel. That's wild. Um, but it's really cool, and I just thought it would be worth showing that Excel is kind of a, its own programming language in its own way. Oh, and hi, Comrade Fishnets. Missed you, missed you originally. My, my phone, I didn't set to uh, not turn off to see the chat. But uh, yeah, hope you guys are enjoying a uh, weird dive into 3D Excel. Uh, ooh, there I am. All right, let's get back to the slides. I wanted to show, again, some keyboard shortcuts just because there are so many useful ones. Um, I've got it divided into three sets. We're not gonna go through all of it. Uh, you can download the slides later and check them out. But I think just getting familiar with some of these really common and uh, useful shortcuts can make your experience at the computer a lot faster. So one thing, you know you can move the cursor with, you know, just right and left. But look at some of these other things. Control, I can move by word, which goes a little bit faster, especially if you're scrolling like this. Um, I can use the home key to go to the front of a line. I can use the end key to go to the end. You can see it going over here. You can see it popping up over here. Uh, page up, page down. I'm sure you've used those before. Uh, tab is an interesting one that in most programs and websites uh, trying to think uh, a lot of times if, if like like say you have a username you can oh of course it does the button I was gonna show oh you could tab to the password field but you can see even here I could put Haley and then tab moves to the button so I could press spacebar and it will will go to that so and to go backwards you can press shift tab you can see tab highlights the next button then it tab highlights this and shift tab goes backwards so we can cycle through things without having to take our hands off the keyboard and that can make us go a bit faster uh hopefully y'all are familiar with cut copy and paste uh these are all amazing but they all have keyboard shortcuts they're all right next to each other so you have uh z or you have x c and v all right next to each other on the bottom left part of the keyboard and uh, yeah, rather than going into edit, cut, copy, paste every time, you can just use a keyboard shortcut and that saves you going all that way over to edit uh, in the top corner. And then uh, shift is, if you hold shift and use these same, all of these same controls, if I hold shift, it starts highlighting, which can be useful if I wanna, you know, bold, say this word, I can highlight like that, but I can use it with control, and now I do the whole word at once, so shift control, or I could, if I was at the end of the line here, I could press shift home, and it's gonna select everything there, or if I was at the beginning, shift end, and I'll select the whole line. So it's just, we can, we can edit text a lot faster when we do that. And hopefully, this one on the bottom you are super familiar with, is uh, Control Z is undo, which is right next to cut, copy, and paste. Um, but if you do something you didn't like, like accidentally got rid of that line, uh oh, I can press Control Z and it comes right back. Uh, not every program has has it works uh, as well as you might have liked it to, but uh, it's a very common function and is almost always mapped to that there. And you can also, if you make a mistake on doing a mistake, you can redo usually with control Y. That one is a little bit, uh, yeah, this one works here. You can see word, I can delete it and then I could undo it, but then I could redo it. Undo, redo, undo, redo. Wow. Anyhow, that's super handy. And uh, if you aren't familiar with the keyboard shortcuts, it's, the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. The second best time is now, as the wise Cohen says. So uh, if you integrate this into your sort of everyday time at the computer, it'll speed you up significantly. 
Next, I wanted to cover some browser shortcuts because uh, we all know we're browsing on the internet all the darn time, maybe not necessarily on a desktop, but these are some of my favorites, uh, especially the tab related ones here. Um, if you're not super aware, I can press Control T to open a new tab. I got, look at all these new tabs I made. I can press Control W to close all those new tabs I don't need. Wow, back and forth, look how fast I'm making garbage. Um, another useful one is, let's say you were doing something and you accidentally closed a useful tab. So it was on Yahoo, I was looking on, I don't want to look at that. Oh god, the news is depressing. Oh jeez, oh gosh, oh man, uh, I don't want to read any of this. Uh, let's, let's look at puppies. So let's say I was looking at puppies. Oh, look at all these puppies. And I accidentally, I had this tab closed and I accidentally pressed Control W twice. Oh no, all my puppies and now I have to look at the news again. Oh God. A very useful one is Control, Shift and T will bring back the last closed tab. And it works sort of like a history button. So if I keep pressing Control, Shift, T, it'll keep opening things I've looked at. So that one is super handy. I use it all the time um, because sometimes I accidentally close stuff, especially when I'm closing stuff really quickly with Control W. Uh, next, uh, another way to manipulate tabs so you don't have to select between them is Control Tab will go through your tabs. Control Shift Tab will go the opposite direction. I'm sorry if that's making you dizzy, but uh, that is a one way to scroll through your tabs. Another way is this would be mapped to Control One. This would be map to control two, this to control three. So I can press control one, control two, control one, control four, control one, and hop around all over the place. So those, those are a few useful ones. Um, another is middle click will open whatever you click on in a new tab. So you could middle click and then press control tab to go over to the thing you just opened. Uh, you can also control click, uh, does the same thing as middle click. So control click, we'll go to this, we'll create this new tab and then I can press control tab to go right over to it. And uh, what else did I put on this list? Uh, refresh on F5, uh, bookmark man manager, browser history, download history. Uh, control shift delete is great for deleting cookies, which oftentimes if you're having trouble with a website, uh, there may be some weird issue with the cookies or caching. So you can delete your history by control shift delete, you can select how you want to clear your cookies and cache, um, which can be super handy. And lastly, I had developer tools. If you haven't messed with developer tools, they're pretty cool. Um, but, uh, like we could say, actually, let's, let's go fix the news because this, this is just, this news is not great. Let's see if we can, uh, Open developer tools. It's probably not going to work because I'm uh, trying to look for underwater footage. Uh, let's change this to uh, everything is great. Puppies are everywhere. And let's see if that uh, doesn't change. <laughs> You should be able to, I thought it would automatically change. I wonder if someone watching happens to know the refresh. I thought that would do it, but it, oh, that might be the, uh, not the, uh, image. Sorry, I didn't have time to prepare something to change, but developer tools, you could change this to say whatever you wanted on any website ever. Um, just, I mean, it's not actually changing it. You're simply changing how it's displayed to you, but, uh, that's how a lot of fake news gets started because they could just say CNN said this, whatever said this. And, uh, really they're just editing the HTML of the site. So it's not that fancy. Anyhow, F12 is the, the button for that. And lastly, some cool windows shortcuts. Um, alt tab is one of these fun ones that allows you to switch to the last active window. So if I tapped alt tab right now, I'd go to the browser since that's where I last was, but I could also hold alt and I can see all the windows I have open and then I can select one and have it pop up. Cool. Pretty neato. 
Um, another, some other ones, closing a window is Alt F4. Open File Explorer so you can look at your desktop, downloads, etc. We've got memes. <laughs> uh, uh, Win P. This one is very handy because a lot of times the second monitor settings on Windows are set to something strange where sometimes you plug in a second monitor and both of them go blank. If you press Windows P, you'll see in the corner I, I've got these pop up. So a lot of times if, if someone's having that error, I'll press Windows P and then up and then enter just to see if that changes how the monitors are interacting. And then just it's it's just really useful to have because then you can decide if you want it to extend, duplicate, uh, second screen, PC screen only, etc. So forth. Very handy. Uh, show desktop. Uh, I've got a lot of windows open I need open, so we're not going to press it. Uh, you can also snap windows to a certain direction, which is pretty cool. Uh, windows up maximizes the current window, but you could press it again uh, to, or you can press right or left to move it to the right or left, so you can put more things on a screen. Uh, you can minimize all but current windows, and virtual desktops are kind of handy depending on your workflow. I'm not going to do it because you're not going to be able to see it because it'll make a new desktop where I'm there, but you aren't because you're on this desktop. Uh, this is something that's a little bit easier to use in Macintosh uh, machines. They, they've made it a little bit handier and more apparent how you can have virtual uh, multiple desktops, but uh, Windows has the feature as well. Um, it just helps to know the keyboard shortcuts to create them and move between them. Uh, but again, I can't really show you it because it's just going to, you're going to still see this desktop and I'm going to be in some other virtual desktop that you don't get to see. But regardless, pretty cool feature. And uh, if you haven't used it before, I would recommend it. All right, wow, we're going 28 minutes? Okay, I gotta speed it up here. So I wanted to show all that cool stuff because all of it is so handy and it can make your ex your computer experience go a lot faster. Uh, scripting. Uh, the major difference between scripting and programming is that scripting requires another application to speak like, scripting is speaking a language that only a certain application can understand. Whereas a program has been compiled in a language that the processor or the operating system can understand. So scripting is usually going through something else. For example, bat scripts, um, these are just files. Uh, we could make one right now that goes to a folder. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on an example, but we could go to a certain folder uh, Haley slash users, and then we could X copy all those files to a place called backup place. And say if we saved this as a bat file, uh, test.bat on our desktop, again, uh, Windows E for bring up Explorer, go to the desktop. I could run that. It's not going to work because that CD command is not properly formatted. <laughs> uh, but uh, regardless, I could put this bat file, let's say, in the startup folder, and every time my computer started up, it, it could copy uh, a certain folder to my external hard drive's backup place. So bat commands are basically uh, the, the Windows command shell, cmd.exe. Bat commands are speaking Windows command shell. Um, in Linux, you're often using bash is one of the really the really common shells uh, on a Linux terminal. So bash has its own scripting language that is even more complex and has you can do some amazing things with bash. And uh, you could look up online some bash scripts that might might make your Linux user experience a little bit swifter and smoother. But uh, that's going through bash to speak its scripting language. The other one I really, really like is Auto Hotkey. So just real quick, this is how I don't know if any of y'all had talked to me on the internet, but I've got lots of emoticons that I use because I I, I miss emoticons. After emojis came out, uh, they're they're then they're not as expressive in so many ways. Like look how happy this little guy is, and I just have to type and how, and then he pops up thanks to Auto Hotkey. Uh, I've got shrug up there. I've got a derpy shrug, derp shrug, regardless. It's basically the same. You, you can 
create these on your phone, like a when you type this, change it to this, so you could make it say, you know, percent shrug, and then type in the shrug emoticon. But you can also do all sorts of amazing things with auto hotkey. I have this thing at the top here, uh, which I found online, but it was because a certain program that I use, Evernote, doesn't have the feature I just talked about with style sheets. And I love style sheets, but there is no, there's no option for font style sheets in Evernote, which is really annoying. So I have this script here. So when I press control shift one, it's going to use this set font style function, which we'll talk a little bit about programming in a second here, but it's going to use the set font style function, which is defined down here and it's going to set my style for me. So I can select this and it brings up that font dialog box really quickly and changes it to basically the equivalent of a heading. It's not doing the cool style sheet thing where if I change one heading, they all look like that, but it at least allows me to organize my notes and not have to select this and then change it to bold and select, set the size to this, etc., and so forth. I can select anything here and boom change it into a bolded version. So I use auto hockey for that. And I've, I've had scripts in the past that did other cool things, but uh, regardless, all of these things, you can look up online and find out cool ways you might be able to make it work for you. All right, uh, so let's move on real quickly to programming. So this is how we talk to computers in their language. And I mean, what a programming language is, is that the computer speaks machine language or assembly, which is, which is talking almost directly in like how to flip switches and where to put things. It's not very human friendly. So we've made programming languages so that we can speak in a way that kind of has its own grammar that's a little bit more readable and understandable and then have that compiled into something that the computer understands afterwards. So there's a few features of most, if not all programming language languages that I did want to go over really quickly. And the first one is the concept of variables and functions. So variables are places to store information and functions are things to do. So in this very simple example we've got here, we've declared X as 55 y is 23, and then if we had a function called add two that could take two variables, we could th use this function and it would output 78. Now that's one example you saw very briefly in my auto hotkey script. See, uh, well, we'll talk about ifs in a second, but uh, when I press control one, it uses the set font style function and again, it's taking these two arguments, bold and 18. And then this function is defined here with weight and size. And then here's the actual sort of things that it needs to do to execute that function. So programs are ultimately just a bunch of variables and functions that do a bunch of things together and allow us to do all these amazing things uh, and, you know, efficient things, or they allow us to play Fortnite. Like, there's a zillion things you can do with programming. Really, the limit is your imagination. And I know that sounds corny, but uh, I don't think many people think of programming as a creative uh, art or tool, but it very much is. It has a lot of things in common with uh, art in that you're like learning how to solve problems, which are ultimately a bit more rational and logical because you're sort of speak into a computer, but you're getting it to do things that you couldn't do on your own, or it would take you a really long time to do on your own. So um, variables and functions, that's one of the bare bones features of programming. Uh, the next is uh, the if then else. Oh, I didn't have the animation to change it, but uh, I wanted to talk briefly about, uh, you know, the common perception of artificial intelligence is that it's doing something, wow, it's modeling like the brain, which has all these interlocking systems and no, no artificial intelligence is anywhere close to anything like that. Ultimately, what we have for artificial intelligence right now is ultimately a bunch of if then else statements. And it, this kind of shows you what that means. So 
when you when you're crafting a program, you can tell it, well, if this happens, then do this and then finish. But if that's not what happened, else you could make another if statement, then else, and you could make this go on forever and ever and ever and ever. That's ultimately, I mean, AI is doing a mixture of like statistics modeling as well as if then else's. Um, it's not really, I mean, I guess that's kind of what we do with intelligence, but AI has a long, long way to go. And uh, right now it's basically this. Um, to give a, I do kind of want to give an example. Yeah, we've got time for a quick example of if then else. Um, so if I, if I made the variables a equals 10, b equals 5, I could make an if statement that says if a is more than b, print, wow, a big, but I could say, uh, else, uh, I wish this, else, if a equals b, uh, then print, wow, they the same, and else again, we could just have another statement. I mean, it depends on the language. The grammar is going to be different in a lot of them, but if a is less than b, then print, wow, b big, and boom, we've got an if then else, uh, because if and then then print else a equals b do this else a is less than b do this and that's kind of the gist of a lot of programming is if then else's variables and functions you're kind of juggling mostly those um to do a lot of cool stuff the last thing that is a major part of most programming languages is uh, i didn't have the animation so it's just going to show it but that's the for loop. And what that means, it's like an iterative loop where it does this over and over. And you can even add some if then else's inside of a for loop. So here's Mo uh, throwing out I and uh, for loop finished, but I comes right on back to enter into the for loop. So we'll, we'll make a, a real quick, quick one uh, with my sad Python skills. But uh, the way Python just makes a for loop. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for the for the pity lap, Fun Muncher. Um, it's surprising, you know. I do security. I'm I feel like I'm a pretty advanced cybersecurity professional, or like an intermediate. I'm a, a journeywoman cybersecurity professional, and I, my programming skills are not great. So when I was in high school, and they were like, "Oh, do you want to do computers?" and I tried programming, and I was like, "Nope, don't want to do that." And that's all I thought you know, a computer job was, was programming. Now I realize there's so many facets, but I think it is good to know programming because it, it, I mean, it informs everything. It's definitely one of those things you definitely need to learn how to read it. Uh, but my doing factor is not fantastic. So for a sample for loop, uh, in Python, it would be for variable in range one to six. So let's say we're just making the range go from start start the count at one, make it go to six. And then uh, if, uh, or we could just have print i. And then that's it. Like that's it. It just prints i. So for this right here would print one, two, three, four, five, six, because it's just taking the first i and then performing the next I, and then performing the next I, and then performing the next I. A lot of those CVEs need some tweaking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's always going to be there's always going to be uh, an ability to tweak. And uh, yeah, if you wanna if you wanna take a CVE and make it your own and spice it up, you're gonna need to know some programming. So it can be handy there as well. Um, so there's a very basic for loop. But we could also add in uh, a little logic there. So we could combine it with, I'm just going to do two spaces. Um, if i equals 3, then uh, we could say continue. So that just means skip over what you just saw and keep counting. So if we played this one out, 
we would see one, two, four, five, six, because it saw if I equals three, and then basically print is its else statement. It's like, if it isn't three, then just keep doing what you're doing. So uh, that this statement here, and I'm not sure exactly, there's probably some semicolon I'm missing that would make it not run, uh, but this would print one, two, four, five, six. And if I took this out, uh, since there's no if logic to determine if something happens to do else, then we're just going to print one, two, three, four, five, six. That's the super basic uh, breakdown of some of the features of programming languages, but it's those three features that allow us to do all this craziness. Um, it's kind of cool to look at the old computers, like the first computers. They were just holding like values inside of these pressurized tubes. So you could, you could hold, let's say like 16, and then you could hold four in another set of pressurized tubes. And then you could use a function, let's say it had an add function and a subtract function. So you could tell it zero and those pressurized tubes would instantly pressurize another tube with the answer. Um, which, whoa, fascinating. Wow. Look how fast it calculated it, even though it's very simple. Ultimately, it, that emergent property of lots of simple things done over and over allows you to play with this logic in really interesting ways. And a programming language lets you play with it in somewhat human readable format so that you can devise a 3D engine in Excel or uh, play a game or make a word processor or, or a web scraper or any sorts of cool thing. I would highly recommend this book, uh, Automate the Boring Stuff with Python because it includes a lot of cool little projects of like giving you ideas of what you can actually do with your programming, your dangerous programming skills, um, as opposed to a lot of books, which are like ah, little projects that show you what it does, but doesn't really give you a feel for something you might actually want to do in real life. Uh, so I'll mention it again at the end of the class, but, uh, that's the gist of programming. There is so much more to it, but I just wanted to introduce the concepts because it, those concepts, I'm pretty sure you understand. And maybe if you have a question or two, you could Google it and figure out the rest. Um, but uh, those three things are kind of the major parts and that's the variables and functions, if then else, and the for each or the for loop. Um, those three things allow programming to do all sorts of really cool stuff. So the last thing I wanted to talk about, and I'm just going to live go through this site, uh, just because I could try and talk about regular expressions and just talk about it. And it might not make as much sense as just literally doing some regular expressions. So we're going to go over to a website I really like. And, uh, like I said here in the subtitle, a regular expression is just the ultimate search for anything language. And we'll see how that works. But uh, as these get complex, <laughs> it can be uh, really ridiculous looking uh, because you have all these operators that make it look insane, but you can make it do all sorts of things for you. But uh, some really complex regex out there that does some cool stuff, but it might look like a cat walked across the keyboard. <laughs> so that site I'm going to show you is regex1.com. I would highly recommend going through this tutorial yourself. Um, just to give an idea of how reg regex works, regex, regex, I'm not really decided whether, which way to say it, but in this example, it just wants us to match all three of these lines. So we might here just want to use the common letters on all three lines, A, B, C. Oh, look, it matches on all three lines. Hooray. But if I put D now, it only matches two of those lines. So A, B, C, we got all three lines. That's a pretty simple one. This, get, this can get very complex, so th we're not going to go that far into it. But uh, in this case, we want to match all the ones with numbers. So we put one, two, three and cool. We were able to catch all of them, um, which is putting in the numbers. Next here, we're trying to get the period character, um, which is in these three that we want to match and we don't want this one. So they're trying to show you that if you put period that matches anything like see how it's matching C eight question mark and a the period character in regex stands for wildcard. Um, it's not actually a dot to make it an actual dot. We put a backslash in front of it. 
Now you can see it is matching just on that period at the end there, rather than the first letter of everything. If I put dot, 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 it would match all four characters, um, because the dot character is a wild card. Pretty cool. Um, I wanted to get, oh, here's an interesting one where here they're telling us to use brackets so we can select only the things in this bracket. So in this case, we want to watch Can Man Fan, but not Dan Ran Pan. So we would throw in brackets. Looks like the first letter we want to match here is C, M, or F. So we put CMF in brackets and then AN. And uh, look, we got all three of those. Um, and we could throw D for Dan in there and Dan would get included. We could throw R in there and Ran would get included, etc. and so on. But it, it's really, it's like this type of search functionality is a lot more precise than the type of like Google searching where you're just looking for a word and you can do words uh, in regex as well. Uh, slash W is any word ish character. Um, but let's uh, CMF move on to the next stage here. We want to watch hog and dog, but not bog. No bogs, only hogs and dogs. So they're telling us up here that if we put the carrot symbol, it will not match these things. So we could put in carrots, just don't match a B and then anything else. So not B og, but we got hog and we got dog and we got nog and sog and tog and all sorts of ogs. But uh, let's see how many more. Uh, this one you can you can define more things in your brackets. All right, yeah, I want get, to get to the next one after this one. So I could define I want A through C in my brackets, and I've got it there. So a lot of times a common, like, I want to match all letters is an A to Z, A to Z, 0 through 9. That matches all alphanumerics, um, which is a handy one that we use a lot because you have to separate out capitals and lowercase. But uh, here we just want A through C, and that gets us on. This is the one I wanted to show, was I want to match either um, if Z is there three times or more, <laughs> but not if Z is only one time, not was up. We want was ups or was ups. So in this case, we would be, uh, what, W-A-Z, uh, three to five? Yeah, so in that case, I'm only matching if Z is three to five. If I wanted it with just one Z, I could do that. Uh, and if I didn't want that last one, I could make it only match four Zs. But uh, that's a really cool one because, just wanted to show real briefly, if I had a list of things that should be IP addresses, um, some of those are not IP addresses. Uh, we went over IP addresses before, it would have to match this pattern of three digits, dot, three digits, dot, three digits, dot, three digits. We could make a very complex regex that only allows up to 255 in these places, but we can also cheat it with using this slash D for digit. Uh, and so here we've got the quantifier of one to three digits, and then the dot character. Again, we have to escape the dot. But you can see that because this one has four digits, it's not including it. And it's only doing that because I added this caret at the beginning. And the caret when it's outside of brackets means beginning of the line. So I want the beginning of the line to match three digits. And in the case of this one, it does not. It starts with four digits. So that caret helps me there. But what I wanted to show you how this is cool, and often you'll see a lot of regex in, in programs, uh, web scrapers, uh, great use of regex. But if I had a very long list of data and I wanted to just say redact IP addresses or maybe credit card numbers, so that would be four digits, dash four digits, dash four digits. If I wanted to search and replace with redacted, I'm using a fancy notepad called Notepad++. But I could put in that regex and see it's on regular expression search mode and replace it with redacted. And all of my IP addresses got converted to redacted. And the things that weren't real IP addresses got left alone. 
So this type of specific searching allows us a lot of control over what we're looking for. And that's why I think regex is super cool. And when you find a use for it, you will, you will thank it so much for helping you not do a very repetitive task of like looking for IP addresses one by one in a giant list of numbers. So, uh, yeah, regular expressions are amazing. I use them all the time with data manipulation at work. And, uh, yeah, I could go a little further into regex, but we're already at 551. We've got a short quiz, uh, at the end here. This one's short because, uh, yeah, time is a fickle thing and it doesn't exist, but yet it somehow evades me. Uh, so you're going to go to kahoot.it. I'm going to go to kahoot.com. But uh, Kahoot.it, and then you're going to enter in the pin code that pops up on the screen here momentarily. And then we'll do a little quiz. And I do really mean a little quiz because uh, this one's very short. All right, loading up. And now, yeah, go to Kahoot.it, enter in that pin up there. And we'll see who takes home the glory this evening or day or whatever afternoon, wherever, whatever it happens to be, wherever you are. Um, cause like I said, time doesn't exist. Sock, hello, Regex is cool, said no one ever. I don't know about that. Sock, hello. You must have had a, a, a traumatic experience with regex at some point to say such hurtful traumatic things <laughs> yes he plaps loves regex and yeah i feel like i've had little tasks where before i knew regex existed it was a mindless terrible terrible crappy time waste of a task and once i found out that i could use regex to find and replace or search and export or any of those types of things, uh, regex makes my job so much easier. And, uh, you know, I use Splunk a lot of, a lot at work and Splunk can, you know, ingest data of any kind. And so regex allows me to massage the data. Even if the data I got is terrible and not well defined, I can fix it all with regex, which is great. <laughs> Every experience is traumatic, huh? Yeah. I mean, that's, I feel like a lot of computer learning, it's like a traumatic experience and you're banging your head against a wall trying to solve a problem. But once you solve it, you get all of those Eureka chemicals that flood everything and it makes everything better. And you don't need to remember that time that you were traumatized by your computer experience. Ah, all right. Looks like we got four people in for the Kahoot. So let's get going. And uh, yeah, we'll see who takes it home. So first question, it's a multi-select times two the points. And what are some things we can use to speed up our time spent with computers? Ah, uh, style sheets? Does that really save anybody any time? I mean, as Sakello said, does do regular expressions help us at all? Really? Uh, typing practice? I mean, that might make things go faster. And keyboard shortcuts. Uh, yes, S. Bjork says figuring out how to replace a regex expression with another in Notepad plus plus. Oi! <laughs> but it's rewarding when you figure out how to do that crazy, crazy stuff. And yes, that's right. It's one of those like very painful in the beginning, but the more you get used to doing it, uh, the more you realize it's it's a tool in your arsenal that can help you conquer data issues. And yeah, uh, style sheets, I feel like save time. Um, but typing practice, I didn't quite mention, but if your WPMs are lower than 50, I feel like you could probably get up into the 60, 70, 80 range. And that dramatically decreases the amount of time it takes you to input things into a computer. So if you haven't had typing practice before, I would recommend uh, looking up games online to to play and uh, increase your speed every time you sit down. Uh, this one, what Excel calc sheets function lets us search columns and return a specific result? 
I did an example, and it was pretty cool. Oh, Sock, you're getting spammed. I don't, I didn't, I, I, I guess I set up a chatbot that uh, got mad at you. <laughs> but I, I would freely let you spam symbols. I'm, I'm sorry that the chatbot yelled at you. Um, so that function is the V lookup. Um, I also accepted X lookup just in case you're familiar with that one. Um, it's just a fancier version and it, it, uh, automates that process to some degree. But, uh, yeah, the V lookup is one of my best friends for presenting and slicing up data. Scripting is the same thing as programming. Uh, is anything really the same? I feel like that old, that old chestnut, um, you never step in the same river twice. That's my personal feeling, but, uh, I don't know if we can push that onto all of reality, and I don't know if we can push it onto scripting and programming, but... I said false. I can see true here too. I feel like this is kind of one of those answers depends on how you looked at it because scripting is ultimately you're going to have variables and functions if then else's uh, for loops, but it requires the interpreter to do what it does, which uh, I feel like everyone should get points. You're all special and you all answered correctly. Um, but in my head, that's not the same thing because you can't run a script by itself. It requires the interpreter to perform what is inputted into the script. Yeah, programs are compiled, as Sakelo said, and a script, yeah, and a script requires something else to execute. And I mean, I guess a program, uh, even a compiled program requires the uh, CPU to understand it too. So. Everything requires everything else. We all, no man is an island, no woman is an island, no envy is an island, and no computer language statement is an island. Uh, what are some features of all programming languages? Oh, plops. You goof. Uh, we've got variables and functions, the for do loop, uh, if then else, and regex. Is that in all of the programming languages? Are all of them has it? <laughs> yeah, so these three, as far as I know, are in every language, but regex is often in there sometimes, but you might have to import a library to perform regex functions. Um, it may not be part of the core programming, whereas these are pretty much core features going all the way back to Fortran and COBOL and all those old school languages that the dinosaurs speak. Oh, uh, looks like we've got a pretty good competition up at the top here. Uh, last question. Regular expressions could let you search for credit card numbers in a database. I mean, that sounds like something very complex. Could regex really do that? That sounds like something that you would have to do manually. There's no other way besides, yeah, you could, you could search for credit numbers, credit card numbers in a database. And that's actually a cool one. If you, uh, get some malware has regex to look for credit card numbers in the computer's memory, because a lot of times a browser will store it in the memory. When you input a credit card, it doesn't just flush it out right away. It stores it in the, the RAM because they, they hope nobody else looks there. Um, but if a malware did looked through the memory or dumped the memory, it could search for four digits, dash four digits, dash four digits, dash four digits, and find some credit card numbers. All right, looks like Plop took it. Uh, but newcomer SB on the board. All right, so last one's just a poll. Which do you want to review and learn to use right away? Uh, man, I did 20 seconds again. My apologies. Auto hotkey and scripting keyboard shortcuts, programming basics, or regular expressions. I don't think Sakello is going to say regular expressions. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, yeah, I mean, yes, Bjork, they already know that stuff. But yeah, it looks like people want to get into scripting and keyboard shortcuts. And yeah, I love shortcuts. I mean, those ones that I showed for browsers in particular, I use all the time. Uh, and I feel like it makes my browsing go a lot quicker and sometimes 
I don't realize how fast I'm going and people are like, whoa, slow down, what's happening? <laughs> uh, I've seen uh, a, a true hacker at uh, the DEF CON conference uh, in the Darknet competition. There was someone who helped me with a challenge and this guy had like terminal windows just all over and he was just all keyboard shortcuts left and right, just things expanding and collapsing and searching and regexing and like, I could barely keep up with what was happening, and I know what all the features are. I just cannot use them at the same lightning speed. Um, uh, one day, one day I'll get there. But uh, yeah, that's that's it for the quiz. It was a real quick one because time doesn't exist, and I didn't have enough of it. But uh, SB third place, yay! Pixel second place, and on top the Plopper Waffles. Bum 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 bum. <laughs> Blonde Venture, yeah, VI, Tmux, and Adderall. That is quite the combo. <laughs> That'll do it. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you all for joining for the quiz. I went a little bit over. I knew this one was going to be take a long time because I wanted to show some of the shortcuts in action, especially for people that aren't familiar with using them. And uh, how quickly, look how quickly I closed all those tabs. Look how quickly I made some new ones. Look how quickly I brought all those tabs I closed. Wow! Keyboard shortcuts. I clearly spent a little too much time on that. But if you want to learn programming and uh, some regex, um, I've got some resources on my website at 7thDirection.com curriculum as usual. That website I was using was regex1.com. Um, it sort of goes step by step through the, some, some of the various features of, of regex. And then Auto Hotkey, you can go to their website and download. I recommend just Googling for, <laughs> yeah, I'm Haxon. Haxon with shortcuts. Uh, auto Hotkey, you can just go and download. I would Google for some like nifty Auto Hotkey shortcuts. Uh, some people have made some mouse gesture shortcuts through Auto Hotkey. Some pretty cool stuff you can do there. And then lastly, uh, so this is actually glitch.com. Uh, Code Academy is one of the most popular resources for learning various coding languages online. I also really like Exorcism uh, because after you do a project, it links you to a mentor that's sort of just like ready and available to talk and they walk through your code and show you some other ways you might have been able to do it or just sort of talk through any things you had questions about. I think it's a cool combination of Code Academy with a mentorship program. And then Glitch.com you can use like starting code, like you can see some app code, so you can get an idea for how a uh, a basic uh, Facebook mobile app looks like, and then you can play with it and change it on your own. Another thing I didn't mention, um, but if you're really not familiar with programming, I would check out Scratch by MIT, um, which is, uh, this is more for kids really, but it goes to show how programming is ultimately a lot of simple blocks put together. Um, so you could, you know, it, I would just check out the website. I don't have time. I'm going a little bit over time, but uh, Scratch is a great way to show some very basic programming features and how they sort of link together and how you can just plug things into other things, and then you're thinking of it more like Lego blocks rather than like some complex problem you need to solve. Um, I did want to go over pseudocoding a little bit, which is what I do to do programming, is I basically write the program in like, how would I do this? Uh, like you're, you're building like a, like a skeleton of how you would actually program it, and then you have to go in and program each piece of the skeleton. So if I, if I were building a web scraper, I would have to figure out the web scraping and then I would have an input and then I would search for what's in the input in the thing I scraped, etc. so forth. But uh, yeah, if you're interested in coding, there are tons of resources. It's almost overwhelming, but I would highly recommend Code Academy. And oh, and Pawn Muncher asked about the Python book I mentioned, and that is uh, Automate the Boring Stuff with Python, um, which is, again, an excellent project-based book. And I think because it's, I think it's got like 25 or 30 projects, I got about halfway or two-thirds of the way through the book. 
And I, I mean, I learned basically everything I know from that book, and now I just scroll GitHub for libraries and import other people's libraries that have already solved problems, and then I mash them together until things work. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I really highly recommend that book. Uh, but if you are not familiar with programming at all, uh, Scratch and Code Academy and Glitch and Exorcism, Exorcism are all great starts. So yeah, um, Pondmancher, thank you for joining. Uh, S. Bjork, uh, Machine Factor, Sakello, Plops, Negihama, Pixelmoth, thank you all so much. This was a joy, and uh, yeah, so we've got two weeks left on the curriculum that's going to be talking next about what happens when you type a website into the address bar and press enter. So we're going a little bit over the technical pieces of, of what's happening behind the scenes on the computer. Um, that makes that seem instantaneous, but so many things are going on. And then at the end, we'll just do a chit chat recap and maybe talk to some folks in Discord. Again, you can find my Discord in the links uh, below below me on uh, on Twitch. And uh, yeah, see my website and uh, have a great day. Uh, the world has beauty if you look for it, and you're all beautiful people, and uh, thanks for joining again, and we'll, we'll see you next week. Bye bye Oh, I gotta switch it first to this one. Okay, now I can... Bye 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 See you next time! Bye bye Okay, bye! Seriously, goodbye. Bye bye